We've already learned the basics about electric fields and how to find the electric field due to a point charge, but now we're going to focus on finding the electric field due to a continuous charge distribution. There's a general pattern or a method that we're going to follow in finding the electric field of any two or three dimensional object. We're going to go through that first and then we'll see an example of using this method for a line of charge. For starters, we're going to choose a very small piece of our object with a charge of dq and a length of dx, or possibly something similar. Often our small piece of the object will be particle-like, but sometimes a different geometry may be useful. For example, when we find the electric field due to a disk of charge, we'll use a thin ring of charge, and in that case, instead of having a length of dx, we may use an area of dA. Our second step is to write an expression for the electric field produced by that small piece and determine its direction. Most of the time, this simply relies on our equation for the electric field of a point charge, which is kq over r squared. But every once in a while, for example, when we're doing a disk of charge, when we have something that's not a particle, we'll use a different expression for dE. Also, I like to point out that a part of this step is to determine its direction. That's a step that's part that's quite often forgotten, but really crucially important to step three. And step three talks about determining if parts of the electric field are going to cancel when you're adding up all the various DE values. If there are parts that will cancel, commonly would be an X component or a Y component, then you want to write an expression for the part of the field that does not cancel. And our final step is to add up all of the little bits of electric field to find an expression for the overall electric field. As we know from mechanics, when we're adding up a bunch of small pieces, we're taking an integral. Often, to be able to take that integral, we're going to have to rely on some charge densities because having dq in our expression is usually less than desirable. So those charge densities that we commonly use are either a linear charge density represented by lambda, a surface charge density represented by sigma, or a volume charge density represented by rho. You'll notice these are pretty similar to the mass distributions or mass densities that we learned in mechanics. The only difference here is instead of being mass over length, mass over area, or mass over volume, we're using charge. So let's look at an example of doing this. We're going to look at the electric field due to a line of charge. And a couple of things that we can assume, unless you're told otherwise, you can always assume that it is a uniform charge density. That means that the charge is uniformly spread throughout. Also in this case, so we're going to assume that the point where we're looking for the field, which is point P here, is exactly above the center of our rod. So let's start out with step one. We're going to take a tiny piece from this line of charge. By the way, talking about this being a line of charge would be really similar to if, for example, we had a current carrying wire and we were looking for the electric field from that current carrying wire. This little piece of our wire, or little piece of our line of charge in this case, has a field of DQ, or a charge of DQ, and we're going to say that it has a length of dx. A couple of other things to define. We'll say that this is located a distance of x from a point that's directly below where we're looking for the field. And we know that we will also care about the distance r that it is from um, our point where we're looking for the field. And there's that distance r there. So now to write an expression for this little bit of field dE that's caused by my little bit of charge dQ. Since dQ is like a point charge, we can rely on our expression kQ over r squared except in this case, it'll just be k dq over r squared. Now that we have an expression for that little bit of field, we also want to think about its direction. Since my line of charge is positive, if I place a positive charge on p, it'll be repelled from my line of charge, or more specifically, it'll be repelled from my little bit of charge dq, which means its direction is directly away 
from that little bit of charge. Now, if I think about another piece of charge, another little bit Q, let's say that my other little bit is located approximately right here. Again, it would be a positive bit of charge DQ, and it would produce a field that would look something like that. I could do the same thing over and over again, but hopefully with just two examples of my little bit of field, you'll notice that all of the X components would cancel out when I'm adding up all of the DEs. That means what we really care about, the thing we want to focus on is the Y component. To write a Y component, for this field, I want to um, define an angle theta. Here's my angle theta right here. And so if I'm only focusing on the y component, because those are the components that won't cancel out, I'm going to multiply this expression by the sine of theta. Now I get to the point where I get to add everything up. So I take the integral of both sides to find my expression for the electric field at point B. That electric field we know is in the positive y direction. When I add up all of these pieces, I have the integral of k dq over r squared times the sine of theta. Now we have a little bit of a problem here because my integral is in terms of q. q is my variable. But I know as I choose different pieces of this line of charge, r is going to change and theta is going to change. So that means I need to find another way of expressing this function here so that I only have one variable in my integral. The first thing that we can do is rely on our linear charge distribution. We know that that can be expressed as the total charge divided by the total length of our line. But because it's a uniform charge distribution, that can also be expressed as dq over dx, our little bit of charge divided by its little bit of length. Additionally, I know that r can be expressed as the square root of big R squared plus x squared. Finally, I know that the sine of theta Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so the opposite is capital R, divided by the hypotenuse, which is little r, or big R squared plus x squared. When I make these substitutions, I will then be able to take the integral of my expression for the electric field. I'll have e of y is equal to the integral of k, now, instead of dq, I'm going to solve this expression here for dq. They'll say dq is equal to lambda times dx. And that's what I'm going to plug in here, lambda dx. Now, this expression was all over r squared. Now, r squared can be expressed as capital R squared plus x squared. Just getting rid of that square root since I have little r squared. Now we said that the sine of theta could be expressed as capital R divided by the square root of R squared plus X squared. Now when I look at my expression, I see that K, lambda, big R are all constants. The only variable that I have in this expression for the integral is X. So now I'm ready to take the integral, but first I must come up with limits. I want to think about what's the smallest x can be and what's the largest x can be. If I think about the smallest, that would be this leftmost piece right here. And that would be at a distance of negative L over 2 from that point that's directly underneath point B. If I think about the right end, then that would be at a distance of positive L over 2. Now, I'm going to clean this up a little bit, perform a little bit of algebra before I do my calculus. That little bit of algebra that I'm going to perform includes rearranging some variables and combining my denominators 
to express that as r squared plus x squared to the three halves. And we know that k, lambda, and r are all constants. I could pull them out of the integral. But even when I do pull them out of the integral, as I'll do right now, we'll see that this is a complicated integral to take. One that's not easily taken by hand. As a matter of fact, with your calculus knowledge, you can't take this integral by hand. So what do we do when we come across an integral that's impossible to evaluate? Well, when that happens, we're lucky enough to have our textbook. You'll find a list of common integrals. It'll tell you what the integral is and how to evaluate it. So when you have an integral like this, where you have that r squared plus x squared to the three halves in the denominator, and there's nothing else in the numer numerator, you're going to rely on appendix C to be able to solve this integral. If you were to see this on the AP test, then they would give you the general form of this integral. They wouldn't expect you to know how to do it. If I follow that general form of this integral, I find that my field can be expressed as a constant, a lambda r. And then the integral ends up being x divided by r squared times r squared plus x squared to the one half. We evaluate that between negative L over two and positive L over two. So the next thing I need to do is to plug in my limits. I always plug in the upper limit first. Don't forget to square both the numerator and denominator of that L over two. And then I subtract my lower limit. Since my lower limit is negative, really what I'm doing is adding them together. Also, that negative goes away when you square it. Now, if I take a look at what I have in parentheses here, you'll notice that it's two of the exact same term. So that means I can simplify by writing it as L divided by R squared times R squared plus L squared over the one. Additionally, I can cancel out this R with one of my R's that's in my uh, denominator. So I end up having K lambda L in my numerator divided by R times R squared plus L squared over four to the one half. Now there's one last step. Typically in these problems, we are not told what lambda is, but instead we're told that it's a total charge of Q and a length of L. Those are two variables that are quite often allowed to be in our final expression. So instead of having lambda in my final expression, I'll plug in the fact that we know lambda is Q over L. I'll also, instead of writing that as that quantity of the, the one half, I'll write it as the square root. You can see that there is an L in my numerator and my denominator. So I can cancel that out. And so we see that my final expression for the electric field at point P is K Q over R times the square root of R squared plus L squared over four. That was a whole lot of work to come up with that expression. But even though that was a lot of work to come up with that expression, my expression is relatively simple, so to say. You'll notice that as L gets bigger and bigger, the R squared doesn't matter quite as much. And I'll also point out to you that as L gets smaller and smaller, in other words, as this 
um, object approaches a particle, my equation approaches the electric field of a particle. In class, we'll do some more work with this equation, and we'll also look at a few different continuous charge distributions.